Hello and welcome to the Direct Spans. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having a less quack day than myself. Today we are going to be going over arguably the most fringe and quack theory I've ever made. It's either going to be proven in quite a few years or completely disproven within a week. Today we are going to be talking about the greater magics of World of Warcraft and how the first ones may be integrally intertwined with the concept. For the regulars I do warn, in this theory I go over a lot of things I've mentioned in previous content. That said, this is, overall, technically a new theory. This theory starts with an IRL concept, the end of physics. The idea behind the end of physics is that at present physics explains a lot, as in most things in the universe. However, physics doesn't explain everything, and to be clear I'm not referring to how the universe was created or what happens when we die. There are still things in the universe that either have no explanation behind why they exist, or just break our current knowledge of how things work. Historically, this concept has played out at least once before with the transition from classical physics to modern physics. And one of the funniest modern examples I know of that proves the end of physics will eventually happen again is 0 times 1 against 1 times 0. To explain that, you multiply nothing by 1, there's nothing. So the answer is 0. Now basic math says that if you flip the equation, so multiply 1 by nothing, you get the same answer. Zero. There's just one problem with that answer. You just broke one of the laws of physics. Conservation of energy. Nothing is destroyed, only transformed. So the question is, what happened to the one in one times zero? This is a very basic example that doesn't get into undefined numbers. And there are other mysteries, like 1 over 137. But if there is a lesson to be learned here, if anyone decides to tell you there are no great mysteries left in the world, I feel like I can safely say they're wrong. They just need to know where to look. The concept of the end of physics translates into World of Warcraft and the cosmology map, because as I have hopefully pointed out on multiple occasions in other theories, the cosmology map explains a lot, like a crazy amount of stuff in the World of Warcraft universe. With what I have assumed to be the current rules of the cosmology, everything including the existence of the Shadowlands makes sense and has a plausible explanation behind its nature and existence. Recently, however, new lore seems to be hinting at there being more rules to the cosmology. From Sylvanas' revelations when she touched Azerite in Before the Storm, and Shadowlands implying life and death magic are significantly closer to each other than we've known, to recently in Shadows Rising where Illyria and Torellian were finally able to touch each other without feeling pain because of their emotional states. A considerable feat considering one is of the shadow and another is of the light. It becomes clear the rules of the cosmology, despite how deep they are, are seemingly a lot deeper. Not so much as to justify throwing the cosmology out the window, but enough to finally create a quack theory that basically creates a World of Warcraft version of the end of physics, and if true, will likely span far into the future of World of Warcraft's lore and universe. Moving to the lore, we start with Shadows Rising and some wise words from everyone's favourite lore, Von Sam. Quote the parts that I think are integral pieces of information. Death brings light, great will turns. Slowly? Yes, over eon, but it turns. Bodies decay and new life springs from it. All things that seem eternal end, then rise to find new purpose. There is a harmony to things, a way, a flow. Ancient ones, spirits, lower. In time we too must embrace the end, long, deep slumber. And without us? Eh. Our followers find strength in other things, in themselves or new beliefs. They grieve, they grow, just like you. And when the veil of dreaming lifts, the eternal and great beings climb on the wheel once more, bound to it, and slowly, ever slowly, the wheel spins. And then a few paragraphs down the page, Belanji basically translates Bonsambi's words into a lingual thought. The ancient and powerful things of this world are eternal. So for this theory, ignoring the massive implications these quotes imply when you think about them in a literal sense, what this part of Shadows Rising seemingly indicates is that the true powers of the universe don't die, but will not necessarily come back in their original forms, or even possess literal forms. Instead, from what I've understood, it's more like echoes of what these beings were eventually resonate through the universe after death, and may eventually affect those on the wheel. 
The reason I'm explaining these quotes and concept is because as we move through this theory, you need to know that this is a concept based in the lore of World of Warcraft and not me keeping my head in the pond for too long. As well as for this theory to make sense, you're going to need to keep this concept in mind as we move forward. The simplest way I suggest doing so is by just remembering this saying. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Now, moving on to where the quackery begins. Three Sisters comic, which despite some interesting art choices, is a story that I have personally been convinced since its release, quietly hinted at something important within the lore. I just couldn't put my finger on what. The hint was the Windrunner siblings being equated to the Sun and the Moons, a piece of lore carried over from the War Crimes novel. Illyria, Lady Sun, Sylvanas, Lady Mood, and Varisa, Little Moon. I cannot stress enough, in a comic that was just supposed to set the scene for BFA and basically act as fan service, showing what would happen when the Windrunner sisters reunited, how odd it was that such a specific piece of information was brought back and highlighted. From a book, might I add, published four years prior. Now, you could say that's just good research. But when you consider the fact Brisa basically lies to Illyria about what happened between her and Sylvanas during the events of war crimes, and who out of the two of them wanted Garrosh dead the most, and the cause of their meeting to begin with, you start to realise either A, a massive oversight occurred in the creation of this comic, which I doubt, or B, these references weren't by accident. And with everything currently going on within the lore of World of Warcraft, things have finally started to align. As I mentioned, the six magics are being fused together. What's intriguing is certain characters and concepts are being related to these fusions. Sylvanas, Lady Moon, Life and Death. Illyria, Lady Sun, Shadow and Light. In their own right, the separate stories of these two sisters is revealing the separation between these two sets of magic isn't as straightforward as it would seem. And what's even more compelling is when you review Varisa's role in the comic, it becomes clear she is also a part of this trend. During the comic, her words explicitly spark the chaos between Illyria and Sylvanas for a reason that I seriously cannot stress enough was incredibly odd. Why did Varisa lie? In the same comic, Varisa is also the creator of order. It's her words that stop her sisters from coming to blows from a lie she created. And Varisa is also the one who manages to seemingly inadvertently stop Sylvanas from ambushing her sisters, once again keeping order where there would have been chaos. So for all intents and purposes, Varisa seems to be Little Moon, chaos and order. As abstract as this idea is, two things come from it. Firstly, six magics become three, which when considering the dynamic between the light and the void as just one example, is not that much of a revelation. The magic sets can basically be equated to coins, each side having a different and opposing face that is fundamentally different, but are still a part of the same coin. What is interesting though is that with the three sisters being associated with specific concepts, they reveal an intriguing dynamic. Life and death and light and shadow are quite willing to war each other, However, the puppeteer that can start and stop these conflicts is chaos and order, which, I will admit, is pretty much explained in the first few pages of Chronicle Volume 1. But what's rather striking is what you notice when you look at the foundational differences between the Horde and the Alliance post-Legion. The Alliance quite notably recruiting the Lightforge and Void Elves, while the Horde bolstered its connection to life and death with the recruitment of the High Mountain, and despite their overt arcane connections, the recruitment of the Nightborn because of their innate connections to a loom. Either way, keep in mind Varisa of Chaos and Order was the cause of separation and unity between Shadow and Light Illyria and Life and Death Sylvanas. And quite specifically remember the fact Varisa has twins. That will come back later. The second thing to come of this stretched equivocation is a question you've probably thought of. You said the Windrunner siblings, and you obviously read the comic. So are you saying Lyrith, the Windrunner brother, that was seemingly cast away during the Three Sisters comic, has a role similar to his sisters in some capacity? The short answer is yes. The long answer is if this theory is correct, he is basically the linchpin that's either going to set off the end of the cosmology or possibly save it. 
To understand that statement, we have to jump back to an old theory that's getting close to being two years old now, that I honestly thought wasn't going to be explored for a very, very long time, as in two years after the fact is still considerably early. World of Warcraft Cosmology Explained In part one, I go out of my way to explain how the cosmology works, from the literal basics through to what is technically speculation on how the cosmology map maps the interactions of the elements and magics in World of Warcraft. I say technically because to be that arrogant guy, if you want the easiest and most comprehensive way of understanding the cosmology, watch that theory. I've certainly iterated on certain points over time, however fundamentally the whole thing will give you enough base knowledge to help understand what's happening within most magic in World of Warcraft and allow you to iterate on the cosmology in your own way, if you think I am wrong. I do apologise in advance for the sound quality though. Now, in part 1 I establish how magical fusion may work in World of Warcraft. I use this system called RMIs, Rings of Magical Influence, of which there are four, and in the simplest terms I can think of, this system states, the bigger the ring, the more rigid the concept. However, the concept also has a greater influence over the universe, the bigger the ring. This is where things start to get interesting though. In part 2, I theorised there was a fifth RMI, based on the corners of the cosmology, that instead of working like the other rings, worked like a colour spectrum, each spectrum having an overriding influence on whatever it encompassed within the cosmology, whether it be a magic, element, realm, etc. I assumed six spectrums existed. They were Aether and the Abyss, greater forms of the light and shadow. This spectrum basically explains why the cosmology is a rectangle instead of a square, as the assumption was Aether is made up of, and can be broken down into, light, life and chaos, and in a similar fashion, the Abyss can be split into, and broken down into, shadow, death and order. From there I inferred the existence of the spectrums of creation and destruction, which, simply put, split Aether and the Abyss into their creative and destructive aspects, which when presented against one another, create balance within the greater light and shadow spectrums of Aether and Abyss. So Aether was split into life and chaos, which when you consider the concepts underpinning each magic, creates balance. Eternally renewing life does not die in the face of death, it just renews. Chaos and the structure it brings balances out life. Think about the breakers and the primals on Draenor and how balance was achieved by their never ending conflict. On the flip side, perfect order will last forever and never fall to chaos, and so to ensure balance, death or as it is technically described as in Chronicle, entropic decay, is needed to ensure order will never last forever. The last spectrum, which technically originated from a technicality in Chronicle Volume 1 and the Legion's seeming connection to all things destructive, culminated in the spectrums of Fey and Oblivion. The idea behind the spectrum of Fey was that it contained origin magic, the product of the most creative aspects of Aether and the Abyss. Oblivion and its magic was in turn the opposite, and is the product of the most destructive aspects. Now, over time, my understandings of these possible spectrums has changed and varied. Spectrums have been removed, names changed, etc. However, something I was completely stumped on for the longest time was, if these spectrums exist, what in the world does the shadow, order, and life have in common? Especially in contrast to the light, chaos, and death, which I also couldn't figure out a unifying concept for. This is where I need to thank Locke and Bahal Samel from the Shines and Luxus Discord. Locke mentioned this idea to me ages ago and I foolishly forgot. Then recently Bahal Samel reminded me of the idea and I can't be grateful enough, because coupled with recent lore and some other things I have been researching recently, for me the spectrums finally started to make sense and begun to explain a lot of old and obscure lore which practically screams first ones. Also, in the description, there will be two links to some very, very good theories created by Baal Samel. They are definitely worth reading if you have the time. Now, what do you think the light, chaos, and death have in common? If you haven't already guessed, the answer is the sun, which, when you think about it, is really a no-brainer. 
and with everything we've seen in recent lore, and the most common sense answer to what is the opposite of the sun, what does the shadow, arcane, and nature have in common? The answer is the moon. Here's where things get wild though, and I know I've mentioned it a lot in recent content, but for those who have watched Flames of Dawn, you'll enjoy this next part. Life, magic, the sun, chaos. The four corners of the cosmology. At the very least, the four greater magics slash concepts of the World of Warcraft cosmology. And quite possibly, at most, four of eight. The four main watches of all of them seemingly represent the greater magics of the World of Warcraft universe. And proof this is the case has been so well placed in the lore, it's just flatly impressive. I mean, the fact the adornments of the cosmology corners, which are strewn throughout all of the chronicles, aligned to each watcher is an amazing giveaway. But in game, there are two other instances which are just slaps across the face. The first is the Halls of Origination, where the watchers reside. We know re origination is designed to destroy, we've seen it on multiple occasions. Yet the Halls of Origination are also specifically designed to enable a planetary reset. Initially, you'd chalk that up to RNA being related to life magic. However, in 8.3, Nazoth wanted to use the Forge to literally rewrite the planet and place his dream of Nihilotha on Azeroth, which in the process seemingly would have made his dreams of our future become reality. It basically implies the Forge is a reality forge that can shape the universe around it, but for that to be the case, that would mean reorigination isn't just the sole function of the Forge, or at the very least, reorigination isn't supposed to be solely destructive. This in turn gives context to why there are four different watches in Oldham, each likely representing the primordial magics needed to reshape reality and fully reoriginate a planet. Oh yeah, and where I know I haven't touched on the first ones much at this point, here is the first day giveaway there related to these magics. The Tomb of the Precursors. Not Progenitors, not the Eternals, Precursors. The definition of a Precursor being a person or thing that comes before another of the same kind. A Forerunner. I've gone through this thoroughly in Plains of Dawn, but basically, for a place that was occupied by Titanforged, call a place the Tomb of the Precursors and have that place commemorate the Watchers of Oldham, not the Titans, is staggering because, to our knowledge, the Tolvia know precisely who the Titans are and their role in creating them, and Azeroth, to our current knowledge, has never had any Precursor civilizations. I stress to our knowledge, by the way, and we'll move on on this point. The Watchers might not specifically be built in the first one's likeness, but from everything I've found, there is a high chance they were related in some way. The second instance takes us back to everyone's favourite expansion, Wad. Imol, Mythic Imperator Margok. Throughout the fight, Imperator is blasting players with an array of arcane abilities, with some interesting names. While he's doing so, he's empowering himself with three distinctly different arcane stones, each on a separate altar. One is missing. Once you get Imperator's health to 5%, Trogol runs in with the stone that was above Korag and places it in the empty altar, starting the hidden mythic phase. This stone, for all intents and purposes, seems to represent fell magic. Here's the thing though, from what is described in Code of Rule, we learn these stones, or at least one of them, has no base connection to arcane or fell magic. What we do find out though, is that the stone can be used to infuse the essence of a creature with a specific form of magic to make them immune to that magic. This isn't mentioning, there is only one ability Korag actually has that uses fell magic, and it's one of the magics he dispels. Now, we also find out in Code of Rule that at least two of the stones were recovered in the Grand. When cross-referenced with Chronicle Volume 2, it's likely all of the stones came from the Grand and are in some way related to the progenitor of the Breaker line, Grond, a continent-sized giant who was created by Agrimar, and whose corpse is literally the zone of the Grand. The throne of the elements is what is left of his skull. So, in one regard, because of Grond's Titan origin, we know why three of the stones are quite possibly related to arcane magic. The question is, what about the fourth? 
because it's also made clear in Code of Rule prior to the events of the story, Imperator has no idea what Fell Magic is. Enter the Four Greater Magics and everything I've mentioned so far. As you've probably noticed, the three arcane stones have distinctive colorations. Each, just by happenstance, can be applied to one of the greater magics. Yellow, the sun, the most obvious. White, life. Think about the creatures of Caldera and the Nexus. Purple, magic. And I mean, if the coloring isn't basic arcane magic enough for you, and you're curious why this coloring of all things is related to a loon, think about the color scheme of the Nightborn and Surma. This leaves the final stone to be placed in chaos which creates four breakdowns of arcane magic under the greater magics, and despite technically not being fell magic, considering its look should make you think about the previously mentioned idea that the six base magics are instead three. This idea also quite nicely lines up with Satesh, the Chaos Watcher in Aldum, another occurrence of a magic seeming to be one thing, in his case shadow magic, but in reality is another completely. Or to be more precise, it's likely a breakdown of show magic into the spectrum of chaos, on top of every other possible factor that could affect how a magic manifests. Something you might also wish to consider is how the greater magic spectrums and their interactions with base magics relate to spell breaking. Considering Korag's ability to nullify magic is something the Nightborn, Blood Elves, and Blue Dragons practice with their spell breakers. At this point, I hope the existence of at least four greater magics makes sense, and the complexity they add to the cosmology is clear, because now we start to get into the first ones and come back to the Windrunners and how they fit into this theory, and this is where shit gets wild. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Illyria and Sylvanas representing the sun and the moon respectively makes sense, even Lyrath being left behind in the darkness perfectly fits him into chaos. Which might I add, just to clarify, is a reference to the IRL equivalents of Void, Abyss, and everything truly dark in most IRL mythologies. It's usually the stuff you really, really don't want to mess with. But anyway, with three of the four corners assigned to a Windrunner, and Varisa who is supposed to represent Chaos and Order, obviously not fitting into the corner of life and fundamentally sitting between her sisters, the Sun and the Moon, the question is, did I really come this far to be so wrong? Honestly, I don't know, but there is one other piece of lore attached to this theory which ties it all together. Alderman, arguably the first proper Titan facility shown to players. Inside, there is a fresco based off the IRL Arapasus, specifically the Telus fresco. If you would like to know how this fresco relates to its IRL equivalent, and how the in-game version relates to some very intriguing lore, there will be a link to the content showing to Lucky Dews in the fresco, in the top corner, and in the description. It is 100% worth watching before continuing. I'll start with the first possible version of this theory. Remember how I mentioned to keep in mind Verita had twins? As quacked as it sounds, the fresco is wide. Considering the inspiration of this fresco is Tellus, or Terra, one of the earliest depictions of the Earth Mother in Rome, the central figure is quite obviously Azeroth. Azeroth being World of Warcraft's Earth Mother. This is corroborated by the fact that the central figure is blind, which lines up perfectly with the Torah mythology and how Azeroth tore out her eyes to create the sun and the moon. Furthermore, if you haven't already guessed, I am implying the fresco is depicting the first ones, and Azeroth was one, and or possibly something a lot more powerful. As the Sorrow of the Earth Mother tale from the Torah mythology, within the context of this theory, implies two of the greater magics stem directly from Azeroth. There is also the Mists of Dawn legend from the Torn Mythology, which on the outset seems to describe the creation of Azeroth. But frankly, if Sorrow of the Earth Mother is as old as this theory would imply, it wouldn't be that surprising if the Mists of Dawn was a metaphor describing something a lot grander and older, strengthening Azeroth's status as a first one, if not something more powerful. Coming back to the fresco, this assumption of Azeroth being the central figure leads on to the twin children in her arms. They are quite likely representations of the sun and the moon, her eyes and her children, which take us back to what Verisa may represent, chaos and order, the governing magics of the physical universe, chaos and order. 
the mother of twins, that which brings balance between the sun and the moon. Who in the Windrunner's case, instead of being Varisa's sons, are her sisters. This leaves the last two figures, one of which is holding what seems to be a faceless serpent, and the other that was seemingly stricken from the fresco, the only proof of their existence being for their foot, until you go to the Iron Brand excavation site just outside of Fast Rider Lodge in Loch Lanan and find what seems to be a place dedicated to the missing figure that would have been sitting on a swan. I am willing to say Lyrath probably represents the figure holding the faceless serpent, this figure overall representing chaos, the cumulatively destructive aspect of the cosmology, while the other unequivocated figure may represent the greater magic of life, the cumulatively life-giving aspects of the universe. Who in the present may represent life? I have no clue. But considering the extremes life and chaos represent, and the way the fresco is designed, I would assume they are the equals of Azeroth, however also needed Azeroth to keep the balance. The second version of this theory removes Verisa from the center and places her in the most intuitive spot considering what she may be aligned to. Chaos, and places Lyrath having no other spot in the core of life, which honestly is weird, however when you consider what happens during the Three Sisters comic, the sisters literally giving up on each other and losing hope, resigning themselves to being a broken family and going their separate ways, it's possible Lyra's role and the greater magic of life's role may be at least partially connected to the idea of hopeful renewal, a concept that even in the most dire circumstances, hope can be renewed. I also just want to make this clear, Risa being placed in chaos, at least in my opinion, is not strange at all. Actually it makes too much sense, because I swear of the three sisters, she is the most dangerous. And if she starts next bloody, probably universe breaking alliance horde war, do not be shocked in the slightest. How this relates to the Telus fresco is that the mother figure still represents Azeroth. However, all of the other figures can be attributed to the Windrunner siblings. At present, I am more inclined to think the second theory is correct. However, regardless of which of these theories is correct, if either of them are even remotely accurate, then what we have here are four, possibly eight greater magics that likely have an overriding control of the cosmology, five, possibly nine first ones, each lined with a greater magic and Azeroth in the middle balancing them all out, as well as a question about the dynamic the first ones had in relation to each other. Assuming you think history in some way, shape or form is rhyming with the dynamic between the Windrunner siblings. Common alley in both theories is that Azeroth acts as a balancing force between the greater magics. Now, I am quite willing to say, in the past, Azeroth acted as the older, wiser mother who knew how to keep balance amongst the other first ones. In the present though, that role seems to have changed. Azeroth is now the child, so how in the world does the dynamic work now? Well, when we consider the Titan's belief that Azeroth needs to be rebuilt, and think about the inconsistencies in the Titan's construction across Azeroth, all seem to have distinctly different origins, Alderman probably being the best example. This train of thought hopefully raises the idea that the planet Azeroth may have served the purpose of rebuilding something since day one. As in before Titan's tampering, before the old god's corruption, something was trying to recreate the Azeroth of old, the mother that could bring balance to the universe, or at the very least, was trying to create something akin to whatever Azeroth was. Though for this to be the case, there are a few questions that arise, like what happened, how did Azeroth fall, and why does she need to return? If we take from the Windrunner dynamic, it seems the reason would be that balance was lost. Not because it couldn't be kept, but because seemingly one of the siblings died and in turn, balance literally couldn't be achieved. So if I was to guess, the Azeroth of old made a sacrifice to ensure balance. But the question from there becomes, what in the world could have killed one of the first ones without it being some form of sacrifice or betrayal, and if it was betrayal that broke the balance, what in the world spurred such an action? This is where a question about the cosmology I still can't completely answer comes into play. Does the cosmology show everything? 
On the one hand, and the easiest hand, what we see on the cosmology is what we get. As in, there are layers of complexity the map doesn't depict, but for the most part, everything fits within its confines. This would mean the greater magics of chaos and life, and or Aether and the Abyss, are arguably the most extreme aspects of the universe that will never reconcile and never stop fighting without something bringing them to heal. And if one turns out to be dead, I would be willing to guess we have a good idea about what's in Torghast and what's happened to the survivors. This would also mean that no matter how dark a creature becomes, there are ways to redeem them, as they are part of the universe. The question then becomes, are they worth redeeming? On the other hand, and the significantly more complex hand, what we see on the cosmology is correct, but it doesn't account for the darkness that was probably present in the creation of the universe. Now, the easiest way I can describe how this works is by first showing what I think the prismatic sea of creation did as it moved through the darkness, before the clash of light and shadow. As you can see, I'm basically saying the cosmology was the way we see it now, or at the very least the aspects were there, with a slight colour change, and the darkness existed in parallel. It's quite possible the entities depicted in the Telus fresco, and the stories told in Mists of Dawn and Star of the Earth Mother recount these early days. Now, eventually an explosion happened, and I think that explosion created the cosmology as we see it today, because it fused the original cosmology and the darkness into one. And this is where things get tricky, because the possibility I've run with for a while now is that if this darkness exists, chaos, the bottom left of the cosmology and those easily associated with the concept, is where this darkness of creation is coalescing. This in turn would imply darkness slash chaos slash oblivion slash true death, etc, etc, are the enemies of all. No questions asked, no redeeming features. There is just one problem, and it comes back to that question. How did assumedly the first one of life die, and why did Azeroth sacrifice herself if Azeroth was keeping balance? This is where the odd fresco out comes into play. In Alderman, there is one other fresco. It seemingly depicts a male entity surrounded by children in the face of something. This fresco seems to be inspired from this mosaic that is currently located in the Glyptotech in Munich. If there are any other ancient pieces of art that you think would be a closer fit, please leave a comment. This is the closest one I could find. The mosaic depicts Aeon, who is technically a god of time, but more precisely the god of ages and Telus, with the four children being the four seasons. Aeon, just to be clear as well, is generally considered to be the equivalent of Uranus in this mosaic. And Telus, as you already know, is the equivalent of the Earth Mother, Gaia, etc, etc. Now obviously the in-game fresco drastically changes the original work, placing Aeon in the position of Telus and altering the children that surround him. The important things to note here though are A. This fresco exists, depicting what can be assumed is another entity as old as the other five, meaning there were at least six first ones in the beginning. B. It gives context to why there is a reference to Ta in the Halls of Origination. C. It gives context to the Tauran's belief in the Skyfather and his obscurity. D. It gives context to what the Whispers of the Earth were in the Sorrow of the Earth Mother, if the legends are that old. And E. If this fresco is supposed to represent some form of equivocation to Aeon and or Uranus, then we may have just got the final piece to figuring out how the World of Warcraft universe was created. Because let's say there was the Prismatic Sea and the Darkness. In the Prismatic Sea, there were five entities of creation, or at least there came to be five. And in the Darkness, for this theory, there was only one entity. Now, as we know, the sea began to spread. Why? Well, if I was to guess, the darkness was a required material for the creation of the universe. Now, how this possible entity of darkness reacted to the sea's goal is uncertain. It's likely this entity of darkness fought against the entities of the Prismatic Sea, and this creature could have been the Devil Incarnate. However, it's also possible it could have just not cared and let the Prismatic Sea do what it did, or it may have helped with the development of the initial universe. Anyway, as time goes on, it becomes clear that the sea isn't infinite. And the more it's spread, 
and the more separation occurred. This revelation quite possibly spurs an act of betrayal and or aggression on the part of Chaos and or the Darkness. Hell, they may have ended up working together. Either way, one of the first ones ends up dead, likely the first one of life, and the parts needed to retain balance within the prismatic sea were lost. The sea, in turn, probably started to fall apart and begun to be consumed by the darkness. This is where I think the explosion happened. I think the mother, Azeroth, knowing how to keep the balance, let a clash of light and shadow, Aether and the Abyss and all chaos and life, happen. I think she let two aspects of the prismatic sea basically destroy everything and or drew them in and destroyed them herself, no matter the outcome sacrificing her existence in the process. Why? Well, I think she realized that if the explosion happened, light and darkness would be fused together, creating a scenario where there would technically be an infinite amount of light as it would have fused with the infinite darkness during the explosion, creating the opportunity for peaceful balance without restriction to be achieved by those who strove for it after she was gone. Now obviously this would have screwed over the Entity of Darkness, and unless it was in on the plan, I can't imagine it was happy when all of its power and fundamentally all it had known suddenly disappeared. Fortunately for it, and unfortunately for us, and the mother, I think there was something she did not account for. What happens when you mix all the colours on a colour wheel? Minus the technical explanation, there is two answers. In one occurrence, you'll get white. In another, you'll get black. What can be fused can technically be separated. The prismatic sea and the darkness never truly disappeared. You just have to know how to bring them out. If there is any form of grand conspiracy to end the universe, that isn't just cosmic forces like the light and shadow trying to end each other, I guarantee you it has something to do with the original entity of darkness and all the residuals of its power. Whether it be resurrecting the entity, distilling the power of darkness or the prismatic sea out of the universe, using the combination of light and darkness to create something more powerful, and or just reshaping the universe into one's image, the list goes on. But no matter the case, one rather terrifying reality is always present. If any one of the forces on the cosmology confirmed or speculated to break the balance and consume the others, then it's an almost guarantee they will turn into a more powerful version of the darkness of old. But this time, they'll also have the power of the prismatic sea, and there will be no all-wise figure to save us. I mean, this could be the point of Azeroth, resurrect or create the being of balance from the prismatic sea, but in all honesty, that sounds like a plan destined to go wrong. Unless, you know, the darkness has already made its return, in which case, yeah, we're really going to need an OP entity to save us. I would also like to make this clear. Where I would like to say Torghast is the prison of this entity of darkness, I am more inclined to believe it's the prison of chaos, if it did indeed betray the other entities of the prismatic sea. It doesn't lower the threat such a creature would present, considering of the possible first ones, Chaos is definitely the most dangerous and the most likely to bring back the darkness, willing or not. It's just on top of Chaos that may also be a remnant of the Entity of Darkness left in the universe. And this isn't mentioning that we don't know the goals of the other first ones either. This should also give a possible reason for why duality in the universe is so fundamentally important, and why there are magics seemingly related to Shadow, Chaos and Darkness. Go too far out in one extreme, Regardless of your duality, you reach places like shadow magic, seemingly separated manifestations of the greater magics. Go even further out, though, and you reach the greater magics like chaos, a great magic that contests with the other great magics in the universe to control the universe. If you corrupt your duality, though, and go up and down towards the prismatic sea and or darkness, then you gain another power, arguably the more potent power, that becomes more powerful the closer a creature is to the center of the cosmology in relation to the magics. Basically I'm saying there are three axes of power. One horizontal, one vertical, and an unshown one that relates to depth. This axis of depth relating to duality. Overall once again adding another crazy amount of complexity to the World of Warcraft cosmology. So, 
How does this theory translate to the near future of World of Warcraft? Well, other than giving a possible insight into where the story of World of Warcraft is going and the possible mountain of things that could still be explored in the World of Warcraft universe, I'll give one example. Let's talk Alun and her nature. According to this theory, Alun should be related to the greater magic of magic, if not just flatly being the progenitor of said greater magic. Yet, as is rather evident in lore, her purview seems to be a lot wider than that. Now, when it comes to the greater magics, I am under the assumption that as long as they are present within a realm, the power of these magics can dominate all, regardless of their place in the cosmology. So Alune having such a broad range of magic makes sense. With that said, the moon and the sun have rather odd roles when it comes to the greater magics, because if they are the eyes of Azeroth, the mother of balance, and came after life and chaos, then you'd assume they would have carried some of their mother's power. Which, intriguingly enough, may have happened. What I mean by that is, what is one of the very well-known natures of the moon in general? The answer is the ability to reflect the sun's light. Now, if we generalize that statement and say it's the ability to reflect, but add the surprisingly commonplace notion that in World of Warcraft, most eyes in some capacity amplify the powers that flow through them, then the nature of the greater magic of magic starts to become a very interesting notion, as it would imply to some extent, Alun and those of this greater magic can basically replicate and possibly amplify concepts in the universe. This could give an interesting meaning behind the moon's orbit and lunar phases, as they may indicate what magics are under Alun's command depending on its position. And it might also give context behind why the different types of moons, like a blood moon, full moon, and eclipse moon, have similar yet seemingly different powers, as well as why she may have needed the lawn and internal scenarios to possibly gain greater connections to nature magic. Taking this a step further, depending on how connected to the creation of the Shadowlands moon is, and whether she has the power to create and or reshape a realm, the reason why the Shadowlands are placed specifically made for all dead mortals, regardless of their alignment, may make a lot of sense. The Loon could have mimicked some form of afterlife that already existed, but altered it to draw in and allow all mortal souls in. The reason the Loon may have done this is because I think she may be the final first one, or more precisely the only first one that is currently free, as in the others may be either dead or imprisoned. If I was to guess, I think she might be trying to recreate her mother, or at the very least reincarnate her mother, Azeroth. I will admit though, that is the optimistic version, and that doesn't explain where the Shadowlands at one point was apparently a monstrous place to be. But then again, Alun may have usurped control of the realm from another. But anyway, this would imply the moon is arguably the most versatile of the first ones, but with that said, it wouldn't be that surprising if after the explosion of creation and the current state of the universe, if all of the first ones are now highly versatile and are not solely aligned to their original corners. To finish this theory off, I just want to remind everyone that this is a thoroughly whacked speculation, and where some aspects may be correct, others are going to be spectacularly wrong. I mean, I don't even account for some of the other rather odd and interesting pieces of lore, like the statues similar to Atlas in Alderman, the stained glass mermaids of Alderbar, or the fact the sword on the first one's teleporter create a stupid amount of context and questions about the faceless statues on the dark portal. I mean, I couldn't have been the only one who was asking, why a sword? My point is, this may be the end of the cosmology, but it still doesn't answer everything. So, the end will come again. Thank you for watching.